Hello there everyone, UXW Bill here once again with a video about some audio equipment. This is a little something for the 8-track enthusiast, if there are any of those left out there in the world today, and I figure that there just might be. This particular unit is an 8-track tape changer manufactured by the Mitsubishi Corporation and sold under the MGA brand name. It can accept up to three 8-track cartridges, and when the unit is fully loaded, it will proceed to play all four of the programs on a typical stereophonic 8-track tape, and then it will switch to the next 8-track tape in line, play through all the programs again, switch to the final 8-track tape in the changer mechanism, play through all the programs on that, and then it will go ahead and repeat the cycle. It will do this until the unit is shut off. This particular unit came up during the chat on someone's live streaming show. I don't remember exactly whose show it was or the precise circumstances, but I do remember that fellow YouTuber Wilkes85 requested that I make a video about this unit. And so here I am several weeks, if not months later, doing exactly that. And the timing of this video, I swear it is completely a coincidence. And v Westlife actually uploaded a video recently about a late model Radio Shack 8-track player. And maybe, maybe it served as a reminder for me to get off my duff and make a video about this particular unit. This was something that my dad found at a garage sale. It has the best price in the world written on it, Make Offer. And I think that ultimately they gave it to him. Well, he brought it home, he gave it to me to check it out, and at the time it did work perfectly apart from some burned out light bulbs. There's a little program indicator behind this black plastic bezel, and unfortunately the light bulbs behind that have succumbed to the effects of time and they are burned out. Up here at the very top you get a control that allows you to turn the unit on. You can set it to automatic operation, and that results in its cycling through all of the cartridges that you load into it or you can set it to replay operation, which lets it repeat just, I believe, the one cartridge. I think I've got that correct. The mechanism itself is pretty straightforward, which probably explains why this unit worked when it was found. You can see there are separate shelves in there. Each one has an 8-track playhead mounted at the back of it. Instead of trying to make one 8-track playhead and uh, capstan drive mechanism traverse the entire length of this uh, mechanism and probably make it a lot less reliable, Mitsubishi opted to spend the extra dollar on multiple capstan drives and multiple playback heads. So go ahead and turn this thing around so you can see the back panel on it. As you might expect, this is a stereophonic unit. It's not quad capable or anything like that. I would guess that it was manufactured after the quadraphonic audio craze had passed. So we get a simple right and left audio output for connection to any stereo amplifier with a line level input on it. There is also a level adjust, which means you could probably use this... Um, you shouldn't do this because this is a bad idea, but you could probably turn this down low enough that you could abuse a phono level input if that's all you've got. But I wouldn't recommend that because almost any phono input that you find is going to have some sort of an equalization curve in it and that will make your 8-track tape playback sound rather strange to say the least. So line level connections only. We have a power cord. This is a single voltage unit intended for use on 120 volts at 60 cycles per second. Here's the information plate on the back of the unit. As you can see, it says MGA, Lincolnwood, Illinois, Stereo 8-Track Automatic Changer, model number TD83. It's 120 volts, 60 cycles per second, and 30 watts, and of course manufactured by Mitsubishi Electric Corporation in Japan. The number that is stamped on the uh, press board back of this cabinet, I would imagine, is probably this unit's serial number. Now, I had hoped to give a demonstration of this thing during a video, but not long after that, uh, this unit was mentioned in the live stream chat, I had the misfortune to fumble it, and it fell about 6 inches. And unfortunately, that did a little bit of damage to the unit. I've gone ahead and taken the screws out here. So I can't do a demonstration, but at least we can look at the mechanism. We'll pull this out carefully here so that you can see it. And push the cabinet back to give ourselves a little bit more room to work. 
as you can see, this is a pretty well thought out and reasonably well made mechanism. We have a little circuit board up here that's largely responsible for audio pre-amplification coming in off, the, off of the playback heads and changing the indicator lights to indicate which program on the 8-track cartridge is being played at any particular moment. And all of that stuff works just fine except for the previously mentioned light bulbs that are burned out. You can see that Mitsubishi gave themselves a little bit of credit here. They actually put their uh, three diamond, the Diamond Star logo, on the circuit board in the form of some completely unused solder mask, something that you probably wouldn't see done today. But I would imagine that the designers of this particular item took a little bit of pride in their work and thought about showing it off to anyone who might happen to see it over time. Here, of course, you can see the changer mechanism, the playback heads over here, the gearing on top, I don't fully understand how this mechanism works because I've never watched it operate with the cover off, but the startup procedure is definitely very interesting. If you move this switch to the on position, there's actually a tiny switch over here that's operated by a thin bit of copper leaf attached to the mechanism. And what you do is you slide this switch and it gives this gear, which is ordinarily held in a parking position, just enough inertial motion to set the mechanism in motion and allow this switch to be released, which turns on power to the motor, and then the motor, in turn, takes over the duties of operating the changer mechanism. Now, if you operate this unit with no tapes in it, it will sit here and make a most interesting twang, twang, twang noise. It really sounds kind of alarming. So if you ever find one of these and you turn it on and it happens to go twang <laughs> over and over again, definitely do not give up hope on it. It probably works just fine. But as I said, this unit is not working and what ultimately killed it was my fumbling it. Unfortunately, despite the generally well-built nature of the mechanism, there's a weak point and that weak point is, ta-da! The motor mounts. The motor mounts on this thing are made of rubber. You can see one of them back there. looks kind of a, like a cylindrical shape. It actually had a fastener of metal embedded in the top of it, but when I dropped the unit, the motor was torqued to the point where it was ripped free of its mountings. And you can see that some of those cylindrical cones, those rubber-shaped dampers that serve to keep the motor operating in a nice and quiet fashion. And it really is impressively loud when it's allowed to fall against the chassis, as I found out before I plugged it in tonight without realizing that this had happened to it. It really put off quite an alarming racket. But unfortunately, those things sheared off. And I tried to make a quick and dirty repair with a hot glue gun so that I could at least demonstrate this unit because believe it or not even the original belt, I would assume this is the original belt that uh, came in it from the factory still perfectly good. It's not flabby or rotten in any way. So as soon as I can figure out a way to fix these things there will definitely be a demonstration of this unit. This has to be one of the most interestingly constructed motors I have ever seen. You can see that there's kind of a flywheel and serrations in the flywheel here that probably serve to give the motor a little bit of cooling. If we look back inside the wooden cabinet there, you can see there's a space for air to come in and cool the motor, so that probably is a fan. And then the armature of the motor is actually the stationary part in this case, which is definitely a very interesting design. Equally interesting is the fact that on the back of this cabinet, there's the usual admonition that says, to prevent electrical shock, do not remove the back. No user serviceable parts inside. Refer servicing to qualified service personnel. Well, sort of. <laughs> if we take a look at the motor here, at the rear bearing on it, which is, interestingly enough, the only bearing that this motor appears to have, there is a designation for oil. Now, I'm not sure if they mean for you to put the oil right down here on the surface of the bearing, or if there is, in fact, a little bit of a pad underneath this hole right here for you to add oil to the motor, but it's nice to see that they thought about someone's eventual need to lubricate this motor. Though I would guess this unit was probably manufactured in either the mid to late 1970s or the very early 1980s at the latest. Though I'm guessing it is probably much more likely to be a 70s vintage unit than it is an 80s vintage unit. And in all those years, 
My guess is that motor has never been so much as oiled, which just reinforces a little pet commentary of mine about the reliability of modern so-called permanently lubricated motors, especially in modern electric fans. Just amazes me how those things manage to last like six months before they start sounding like a lawnmower or a wood chipper or a cement mixer with a serious balance problem of some sort whereas a motor like this or even a motor in an old box fan that was intended to be oiled maybe every six months or so you know probably never got that oil by most uh, by most people's standards of care and yet those motors continued to run for years and even if they did happen to lock up or develop excessive run out they can frequently be restored to perfect working order with just a little bit of effort whereas your modern permanently lubricated motor is oftentimes complete trash by the time its its bearings fail wow I got off on a bit of a sidebar there didn't I Anyway, I cannot demonstrate this unit due to the unfortunate occurrence with the little rubber mountings. And it's probably very fortunate that nothing bad happened when I powered this up because the motor is attached to a terminal strip down here. And this terminal strip was probably supposed to be tight at one point, but it's not particularly tight now. And with this motor flopping around in here loose, it could have shorted out on something. So I'm very glad that that did not happen. Let's go ahead and take a look at the bottom of the unit here. Hopefully the motor won't go too far away on us. Nope, it's pretty well stuck in place. There's a long spring that runs the entirety of the bottom of the unit here. It looks like this is intended to load and remove the tapes from the... Uh, it's supposed to provide some kind of countering force for loading and removing the tapes from this unit when all four programs on a particular cartridge excuse me, have been played. The motor comes through over here. There's the shaft, as you can see. This little circular hole doesn't appear to actually have any function in the mechanism. And then the belt, if it were in place as it should be, would be found driving this flywheel. The weighted flywheel serves to help the speed stability. I'll go ahead and I'll operate the mechanism by hand here so you can see how the switching and loading takes place as this unit operates. you got to make sure I turn it the right way, of course. There's the twang sound. And there it has completed a complete cycle. And because the switch on the front here is presently set to off, this little copper wafer here, this thin strip, has actually depressed this switch, causing power to be cut to the motor. So definitely an interesting little design, and one that is perhaps, maybe even a little bit surprisingly, reliable. Well, that's about everything I can think to say about this unit. Hopefully I will be able to find some kind of a repair method for these fasteners and get this motor back into its proper place because hot glue did not work at all, not even for a temporary fix. I think I also need to clean this uh, level control pot here because I remember it being scratchy and that would certainly not be at all surprising given that the uh, upward facing open portion of the control is laid out such that it could have dust fall into it very easily. And as you can see from my running my thumb along the power transformer mounting bracket here and one of the end bells, there's no shortage of dust inside this unit. So right now that's about all I can say about it because, well, it doesn't actually work and I feel pretty stupid for having broken it. But like I say, this is not the end of the road for this machine. I will figure out a way to fix this problem, even if I have to sacrifice the isolation provided by these rubber motor mounts and mount the motor directly to the framework of the unit. And then I can put the belt back into place and it should play once again. To my moderate amazement, given the uh, troubles that you can have with 8-tracks, the trials and tribulations, and why it really takes a person of great faith to enjoy using the 8-track, format. This unit worked extremely well. I did not notice any crosstalk or mistracking or anything along those lines. But I've pretty much said everything that I can think of to say about this unit, so thank you for watching, and by all means, feel free to leave a comment if you have one.